Welcome to Serious Fun and the 2012-2013 season of the Stanford Symphony. We will be continuing to try to surprise you at every concert with something special, something unexpected, just to shake things up a bit. We'll start out our first concert and the new season brilliantly with, in October with one of the ultimate virtuoso pieces for orchestra, Ruslan and Ludmila by Russian composer Mikhail Glinka. I distinctly remember when I first heard this piece as a little boy, I was impressed by how fast the violins moved their bows and I thought, I must remember this. And I did. I remembered the rather unusual names of its title, Ruslan and Ludmila. Considered to be the father of modern Russian music, Glinka created a distinct nationalistic Russian musical style. Ruslan and Ludmila is based on an epic poem of the same name by Pushkin. But Whereas Pushkin's poem is rather dark, it tells the story of the abduction of Ludmila by an evil sorcerer and includes witches, magic castles, enchanted gardens. This music features some of the most brilliant music I know. It is basically the description of a royal wedding and Glinka's inspiration for the music came when he attended a wedding dinner at the Russian court. This music is like a whirlwind, fast and forceful, and it's over before you know it. Our concerto is Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 3, a tour de force for the pianist. It is considered by many to be the most difficult piano concerto of the repertoire. And I guarantee you, this will be no problem for our pianist, Valentina Lizitsa, who, when you find her on YouTube, has more views than any other classical artist. At this time, her most viewed clip has been seen 2,800,000 times. Jean Sibelius was Finland's greatest composer. His music is unique. He painted these immense Finnish landscapes where you can see huge forests and lakes and dark clouds and winds. He uses broad melodies and fanfares and the music seems to flow without interruption. Finnish mythology was a very important source of inspiration for him. And often you can hear the little gnomes crawling around. The first public performance of his second symphony cemented Sibelius' fame as a national hero. It is certainly the most accessible of all of Sibelius' symphonies. It has an heroic and optimistic first movement, a wonderful romantic second movement, a brilliant breakneck scherzo and one of the greatest final build-ups in music history, leading to one of the most satisfying, glorious and majestic endings ever. This is just phenomenal and exciting. Our second concert of the season in November is dedicated to a musical form that transcends the centuries, the Concerto Grosso. We'll start out with two composers that knew of each other, but actually never met, Johann Sebastian Bach and George Frederick Handel. They were born in the same year and their birthplaces were just 50 miles apart, but their lives and musical styles developed in totally different ways. While Bach never traveled outside of Germany, Handel settled down in a different country, London, England, and even changed his name and became a naturalized citizen. They had a couple of things in common. They both had quite a temper and both were afflicted with cataracts. But that's where the commonalities end. The music sounds very different. The music of Bach is very horizontal. There are always several active layers of music moving parallel and horizontally, making it a very intricate and sophisticated web. Handel's music is more vertical and goes often for grandeur. The Concerto Grosso, the Italian word for great concerto, has been an extremely popular musical form. It pitches two groups of musicians against each other. A small solo group plays with and against a larger group of musicians. The variations are endless, as proven by Bach's Brandenburg Concertos, where we have six concertos that feature six very different instrument combinations. We're going to play his Brandenburg Concerto number no. four for two recorders, solo violin and strings. Handel will be represented by his Concerto Grosso B-flat major, a wonderfully lively and majestic piece of music. It is astounding that an old form like the Concerto Grosso has retained its power, even into the 21st century. Our next composer was born in 1975. Afno Dorman is a new composer who uses Baroque forms as models, but infuses them 
with jazz rhythms and even pop and rock. You've got to hear it to believe it. We celebrate the fall season with Autumn Rhapsody, a piece by another young amazing composer, Pierre Jabert, born in 1967. He comes from New Hampshire, won the legendary Rome Prize and received commissions from the Houston Symphony and the Emerson String Quartet. We will end the concert with the Four Seasons of Buenos Aires by Argentine composer Astu Piazzolla. It's a kind of homage to both the tango and the Four Seasons by Antonio Vivaldi. Piazzolla revolutionized the traditional tango by mixing it with elements of classical music and jazz. There are several arrangements of these Four Seasons, but the most popular is the one we are going to play for violin, string orchestra, featuring our own concert master, Erika Kiesewetter. Our third concert brings serious fun and a music tradition back to Stamford, the holiday concert of the Stamford Symphony. Something was missing during this season of giving, joy, family, and music. And so we'll kick off the holidays in early December with this delightful program of classical and popular favorites, two phenomenal singers, and our superb Stamford Symphony. And of course, you'll get to sing as well. Join us for this special holiday concert where the community gets together to celebrate the season. Our fourth concert of the season in February features four very different but truly ingenious composers. Igor Stravinsky, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi, Avu Pert, and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. What a lineup. Like so many other great pieces of the 20th century, Stravinsky's Pulcinella Suite was inspired by the impresario of the Ballet Russe in Paris, Sergei Diaghilev. He was behind the composition of pieces like Daphnis and Chloe, or La Valse by Maurice Ravel, The Three-Cornered Hat by Manuel de Falla, Jeu by Claude Debussy, or The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. And it was Diaghilev who proposed to Stravinsky to take incomplete manuscripts of music by Giovanni Battista Pergolesi, an early 18th century Italian composer, and to arrange them and to make a ballet with the title Puccinella. Puccinella is a character of the Commedia dell'arte, a Hurricane-like character who is witty and cunning, a master of disguises. This could have been a pretty simple and straightforward job, but Stravinsky sat down at the piano and started composing on the Pergolesi manuscript themselves, orchestrating them, mixing things up, composing transitions and adding notes here and there. The result is music where you can hear that it is music by Pergolesi, yes, but you can also hear that something is still really wrong with it. Things that don't belong there. Plenty of wrong notes, accents, wrong instruments, wrong phrasing, dynamics, you name it. Stravinsky later said, lesser artists borrow, great artists steal. Felix Mendelssohn's music, very much like Mozart's, always feels like a breeze of fresh air. His first piano concerto is virtuosic and exhilarating. He was 21 years old in the midst of a two-year European tour when he composed it and needed to get it done quickly. Especially considering the speed of the composition, it is astounding how fresh, imaginative, and spontaneous the music unfolds. It is a profoundly romantic piece, but has, as it should, the typical lyricism of Mendelssohn as well as dazzling virtuosity. Our soloist, George Lee, is 17 years old and he won first prize in both the Cooper International Piano Competition and the Young Concert Artist International Auditions in 2010. George was featured on NPR's radio show From the Top at Carnegie Hall and has performed with the Cleveland Orchestra as well. So expect an amazing young artist playing the Mendelssohn Piano Concerto No. 1. Avo Pert is an Estonian composer who has created his very own instantly recognizable and distinctive style. It is something very special to be able to identify Pert's music after a few seconds, and you will. His music defies description. There is always a tonal center, and Pert's melodies move very often stepwise, either away or back to a bass note, the tonal home. Pert's music has a minimalist character, but he also often plays with silence as part of the music. Actually, the part of music that is very often forgotten. 
His composition, Fratres, or Brethren, written in 1977, is a haunting work for solo violin, strings, percussion, and with very soft melodies in the strings, while the solo violin plays a series of virtuosic variations above it. You hear it once, and you will never forget it. And speaking of unforgettable music, Mozart's Jupiter Symphony is a milestone in the symphonic repertoire. He composed his first symphony at age eight. This is his last symphony. Mozart never called it the Jupiter Symphony. We don't know for certain who named the symphony, but Mozart's son, Frank Xaver, said that the London impresario Johann Peter Salomon gave the work its nickname after the most powerful of the Roman gods. I'm quite sure he named it just to sell it better. It is one of the most incredible achievements of instrumental music up to that point and ever. What really stands out in this symphony, even by Mozart's standards, is the last movement, the finale. It begins innocently enough, but turns into a tour de force of classical counterpoint and makes it a much more substantial movement, paving the way for Beethoven and Brahms. Mozart could not have known that this would be his last symphony, but what a way to go. What a great way to crown his achievements and at the same time to point the way to the future. The fifth concert of the Stanford Symphony in March is a dream come true. We pair Brahms' Song of Destiny with Beethoven's Symphony No. 9 and we welcome the Greenwich Choral Society to the Palace Theatre. Beethoven's Symphony No. 9 pushed the symphonic form to new limits. People hadn't heard anything like this before. The premiere was one of the many great successes of Beethoven. He was totally deaf by then, and the story is that one of the soloists had to turn him around to the audience so that he could see the applause, which he could not hear. From the high energy and tense opening to the furious, wild, and overwhelming ending, Everybody knew that Beethoven had achieved a new, completely new level of symphonic writing. A Mount Everest that every single composer after him had to wrestle with. And they're still wrestling with it. Beethoven never let go of the ideas of the French Revolution. And as he was thinking of incorporating Schiller's Ode to Joy into his music, it was because Schiller originally called it the Ode to Freedom, but because of censorship had to change the title. Beethoven here wrote some of his most dramatic music. He actually added some words of his own, like the famous words of the baritone, oh friends, not these sounds, rather let us sing more pleasant and joyful ones. From then on, one hit comes after the other, like Freude schöner Götterfunken or Seid umschlungen Millionen. It's a celebration of brotherhood, of humanity, and I think that this piece has been so popular for centuries, not only because of the phenomenal music, but also because of its humanistic message that is as valid today as it was back then. April brings us to the last concert of our 2012-2013 season, and it features two of my favorite composers, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky and Anton Bruckner. Anton Bruckner came from very simple beginnings, son of a teacher, the first of 11 children in a small town in Upper Austria. Listening to and performing Bruckner is always something very special. It's a journey, not just a side trip. Bruckner doesn't write short stories. He writes novels. His fourth symphony was given its nickname by Bruckner himself, the Romantic. And he provides us with a description of what it is about. The first movement features a city of the Middle Ages, dawn. From the towers of the city, we can hear wake-up calls. Knights storm out of the city on their proud horses. The magic of the forest embraces them. Sounds of the forest, bird songs. A truly romantic picture develops. The second movement is one that Bruckner describes as Pilgrim's Nocturnal March, while the third movement is a scherzo, the hunt of the hare. In the fourth movement, serious trouble is ahead, with a violent storm breaking with thunder and lightning. There is, of course, much more to the symphony than a description of nature. 
it is as much a personal and emotional journey as it is a spiritual one. This is as heroic a struggle as in any Beethoven symphony. This symphony is a mountain and it's quite a journey to get up there. It's a journey that takes us to a place that many other symphonies will not take us. But if you take this journey and climb up to the top of this great mountain, you will enjoy views of incredible power and beauty. Tchaikovsky's violin concerto was a kind of therapy session for him. He had just ended his marriage that lasted less than three weeks. He suffered an emotional collapse and he fled from Moscow trying to recover. A violin student visited him and Tchaikovsky was inspired to compose a work for solo violin and orchestra. Nothing in Tchaikovsky's life was easy. When he sent the finished concerto to Leopold Auer, a friend and head of the violin department at the St. Petersburg Conservatory, Auer proclaimed that the piece was unplayable. It took many years before this concerto became what it is today, known as one of the most famous concertos in the entire literature. What seemed to be impossible for the virtuosos of Tchaikovsky's time is comparatively easy for the young virtuosos of our time. Nigel Armstrong is our soloist, a finalist in the 2011 Tchaikovsky International Competition and a silver medal winner of the 2010 Yehudi Menuhin International Violin Competition. We have a great season in store for you and we hope you can join us for some serious fun at the Palace Theatre in Stamford, Connecticut. Concerts are on Saturdays at 8 p.m. and Sundays at 3 p.m. For tickets and more information, please call 203-325-4466 or visit us at www.stamfordsymphony.org.